Questions on electromagnetism are usually some of the worst answered at GCSE. So in this video, I'm going to break the topic down stage by stage so that you have a really good understanding what the topic is and how to answer any question on anything to do with electromagnetism. So first of all, what is magnetism? It's an example of a non-contact force. That means that two magnets or magnetic material do not need to be in contact or touching each other for a force to be exerted. There are two situations and two types of forces you can have with magnetism. You can have opposite poles and you can have like poles. Opposite poles will attract each other, like poles will repel. The magnetic field around a bar magnet looks a bit like this. We have loops of magnetic field lines pointing from north to south. In an exam, you'd only be required to draw a couple of um, ones on each side, so please do not draw uh, loads and loads. So how do we know that magnetic fields look like this? We cannot see them with the naked eye, but we can use a couple of different demonstrations to show them. We can use iron filings and sprinkle them on some paper on top of a magnet to show the general shape of the field. We can also use a plotting compass, that's the kind of compass you use for navigation, to show the shape but also the direction of the field. So how we do that is we place the compass at different points around the magnet. When we do that, the needle will change direction and it points in the direction of the magnetic field, which is towards the south pole. Plotting compasses will normally point uh, following the Earth's magnetic field. That's because the Earth has a magnetic field inside it, which is actually has a south pole near the north pole. So magnets will point towards the um, geographical north pole because actually that's the south pole inside the Earth. And the reason the Earth has a magnetic field is because it contains a lot of iron in it. And it actually flips every sort of 100,000 years or so. Um, but the minute it's got a south pole near the north pole. Okay, so those types of magnets, like bar magnets, are usually known as permanent magnets. Next, we're going to look at the type of temporary magnet called an induced magnet or induced magnetism. So induced magnetism can be defined as when a material becomes a magnet when placed in a magnetic field. So let's look at an example of this. Now this only works with magnetic materials such as iron we've already discussed and we've also got um, steel, cobalt and nickel are the four magnetic materials you need to know about for GCSE. So with any of these materials, let's say you had a bunch of iron nails or paper clips um, on the ground, not close to the magnet. When I bring them close to the magnet, the reason they get attracted to the magnet is because they temporarily become a magnet themselves. So they'll have a north and a south pole on them designed to be attractive to the magnet that is attracting them. And if I was to add more on the end, they would also become little magnets as well. This is what induced magnetism is. It explains why materials that are magnetic can be attracted to a magnet and it's only ever attractive not repulsive. To finish off a couple of bits about magnetic fields, a magnetic field is defined as a region or area around a magnet where a force acts on either another magnet or a magnetic material. That's how you define it in words. The magnetic field is strongest at the poles, both poles are equally strong and it decreases the further away you get from the magnet. Let's next talk about how magnetic fields are produced by electric currents. Now when you have a current flowing through a conductor or a wire, the electrons themselves cause a small magnetic field to be produced around the wire. So the fields are circular um, and we can figure out their direction by using something called the right hand grip rule, which is based on your right hand. If you stick your hand with sort of thumbs up, the thumb will point in the direction of the current, your fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field in sort of a circular motion around the wire. So in this case, the current's pointing sort of up and right, the magnetic field is sort of coming around in this direction, indicated by the arrows on the magnetic field in the diagram. If I was to make the magnetic field around a wire stronger, I could coil it into what's called a solenoid. A solenoid is just a coil of wire with current flowing through it, and it is able to increase the magnetic field strength from just the straight wire earlier. Now, the magnetic field around a solenoid, as I'm drawing here, is very similar to that around a bar magnet. It's very strong and uniform in the center um, of the coil, and we can figure out the north or south pole by looking at either end. Now, you can only really use your imagination with this one here. If you look at either end of the coil, the current would either be going clockwise or anti-clockwise. And the way to remember it is by remembering these little diagrams. If it's going anti-clockwise, if you put an N sort of inside it, the N, the curly points on the N sort of look like they're going in the direction of the wire. That means it's a north pole. 
The other way, so a clockwise direction, um, would be a south pole. Again, you can sort of bend the ends of the S, so it looks like the S is going the direction of the magnetic field. If I wanted to make the magnetic field even stronger, I can make it an electromagnet by adding an iron core. The advantage of an electromagnet is that it can be turned on and off very easily, and I can vary the strength by varying the number of turns on the coil and also the current flowing through it, same as for a solenoid. There are lots of uses for electromagnets, things like circuit breakers in household appliances, relay circuits like a starter motor on a car, electric bells, um, electric locks, and lots of other examples um, on, as you see on the screen. For each one, you need to describe what happens to make the thing work. So usually it follows along the line of something like this. Current flows through the circuit, that then causes the coil to become magnetized or an electromagnet. It will then attract um, something in the circuit, usually a piece of iron, and then you've got to figure out for each situation what's going to happen as a result. The next part of the video is only suitable for higher tier students. We're going to talk about motors and the motor effect. So when you place a conductor, like this wire here, in a magnetic field, the two magnetic fields will interact. Now, do you remember before we talked about the wire having a magnetic field around it? Well, between the North and the South Pole, there's another magnetic field. And when the two fields interact, they exert a force on each other. That's what's known as the motor effect. Now, Fleming's left-hand rule can tell us the direction of the force. So using this image here, I'm not going to try and draw this out myself, but using the image here, we can see that the thumb's direction um, is going to tell us the direction of the force or motion. The first finger tells us the direction of the field, so north to south, and the second finger or the middle finger tells us the direction of the current. So in this case, for my example, I've got the field going left to right, so I point my first finger that way. The current is going sort of away from me, so I've got to twist my hand so it's going in the opposite direction uh, to where it was before. When I do that, my thumb is pointing in the downwards direction, so therefore the force goes down. Factors affecting the size of the force in the motor effect are as follows. They're affected by the current flowing, by the length of the wire, and something called the magnetic flux density which is essentially the same thing as magnetic field strength. If I was to reverse any of these factors, the force would also reverse. Now, the equation that governs the, magnetic, uh, the motor effect encompasses all these factors. So if the force is equal to B times by I times by L, now we should know F, newtons, uh, F force is measured in newtons, I current is measured in amps, length we have to have in meters for this to work. The new one is B. B is the symbol we use for magnetic flux density and it's measured in Tesla or capital T. Useful to note is that Tesla is normally quite a small unit. Normally you'll find milli Teslas or 0 0.01 Teslas. Um, it's not normally hundreds of Teslas. That'd be a very, very strong magnetic field. Now the motor effect seems like not that useful. What's the point in making a wire jump up or down? Well, the point is we can actually make things go in circles um, and things like you'd find in electric cars, in an electric drill, in a hairdryer, a washing machine, anything that relies on electricity to go around in a circle. So an actual motor would look a bit like this. So you'd have a, a piece of wire, but instead of it being a straight piece of wire, it would actually be a coil. The reason it's got to be a coil is because we need current flowing in different directions depending on where you are in the coil. So if I connect this to my cell or my power supply, um, on the right hand side I've got the current flowing in the same direction as my example just now. So using Fleming's left hand rule again, I can figure out the force is going to be acting downwards. On the other side of the coil, however, the current is flowing in the opposite direction. It's now flowing towards me. So in that case, what I can figure out is that the force is going to go the other direction. So on the left hand side it's going up, the right hand side it's going down. This causes the coil to rotate. And if you ask the question about it, you'd say the coil is rotating. You'd say current is flowing in opposite directions on each side of the coil. So the force is in opposite directions. And you probably want to explain the motor effect as well, and depending on how many marks the question's worth. Now, some of you might be able to notice there's a problem with this. At the minute, if this coil was to rotate, they would just rotate half a turn and then go back. That's why we need something called a split ring commutator to help us. The split ring commutator reverses the current every half turn, so it allows the coil to turn continuously. So what it does, it's a rotating sort of circle with a gap in it, where it flips over positive to negative every half turn, so that the coil would experience the force on opposite directions on each side of the coil. An application of this you need to know if you're studying separate science is in a loudspeaker. So any speaker in the world works like this. So I've got an image on the screen now. 
It relies on alternating current, which is changing direction, to cause a motor effect in the coil. Because it's alternating current, it's changing direction, so the coil vibrates, it changes direction quickly. Therefore, the cone, where the sound comes out from, also vibrates. Air particles that are near the cone will vibrate at that same frequency, which means sound waves at the same frequency which the coil is vibrating at. Next, let's talk about the generator effect, which is something that, again, is on the separate science-only syllabus for physics. So when a conductor moves in a magnetic field or relative to a magnetic field, we get a potential difference being induced. Now, this looks similar to the motor effect, but in reverse. Instead of producing movement, I'm putting movement in and I'm getting electric current or potential difference come out the other end. Now, it's important to note we only get current induced if the conductor is part of a complete circuit. That's because current is rate of flow of electrons and the electrons can only flow if there's a complete circuit. Now, this can also occur if you've got a magnetic field moving relative to a conductor, like a magnet being pushed into a coil of wire, the same thing would happen. If you don't have movement of the wire, then you won't get any current being induced. If you only have movement in one direction, then you get current flowing one way, and if you change the movement of the wire to go the other way, the current will flow in the opposite direction, usually indicated by an amateur reading going the opposite way or turning negative. Factors affecting the potential difference or the current induced would be the speed of the movement, so if you move it faster, you'll get a higher current or PD, the magnetic field strength, the strength of the magnets, or the number of turns on the wire, which we'll come on to later. If I've got a coil of wire, more turns means a higher potential difference induced. Now, one very important thing to note, which is a very small part of the AQA specification, is that for any induced current, actually, when we induce a current, we have these tiny magnetic fields around the wire, as we covered with the motor effect. When we have these tiny magnetic fields around the wire, they're also going to oppose the motion that caused them. Where would you know where to spot this? You might have questions about something being harder to move, or it sort of slows down some sort of resistance to um, this motion, um, and this is why. Now, in general, looking at the motor and the generator effect, how would we know the difference between them? Um, you don't get marks for this, but just for your understanding, they both require conductors and magnetic fields. In a motor, you supply current in a conductor and a magnetic field, you get force or motion out. Generators, you supply force or motion in, and you get current out. So we'll talk about generators then. Generators involve a coil of wire, so you've got current able to flow in both directions. There are two types of generator, and they're both caused by something being rotated um, and then a PD being induced um, and measured by a voltmeter, for example. In an alternator, as the name suggests, we're going to get alternating potential difference out. So we get potential difference flowing one way, then another way, then another way, meaning we get alternating PD. For a dynamo, we have this thing called a split ring commutator, which we looked at when we looked at the motor effect. This reverses the current every half turn so that the current is always direct or the potential difference is always direct. So if I should draw a PD time graph of this, um, it's not going to be flat, um, but it's going to be not negative. So every time that the um, generator would be negative, um, the PD would be negative, it gets reversed. So now it has this sort of um, shape, um, as you can see in the diagram. That's for a dynamo. Clue of the name is that a dynamo begins with a D, therefore it's going to produce direct PD, alternator um, is alternating PD. One big example of this um, is going to be, rather than power stations and things like that, um, is a microphone. Now, a microphone works in the opposite way to a loudspeaker. So sound waves cause the diaphragm to vibrate, and the generator effect is going to be um, is going to happen because the coil is vibrating. That means there's going to be alternating PD induced um, because it's changing direction, which then gets sent to the circuit. So a microphone, instead of a loudspeaker going current to sound, this is going to go sound waves to current. Finally, let's talk about transformers. So transformers are part of the national grid, um, and you can have either step up or step down transformers. Step up transformers will increase the potential difference um, to reduce heat loss. We'll come on to that later. Uh, step down will decrease the potential difference to make it safe to use in homes. Transformers look a little bit like this. They've got these two sort of iron cores um, either side Transformers look a bit like this. You've got a giant square iron core with coils of wire wrapped around each side. These are known as the primary coil and the secondary coil. Now, in the primary coil, you supply an alternating current to the coil. And what that does, as we looked at with um, electromagnets, you produce a magnetic field. Because it's alternating, you have a changing magnetic field produced around the primary coil. 
Now what this field does is because it's close enough to the secondary coil, that allows an alternating potential difference to be induced across the secondary coil. Without touching it, the current doesn't flow through the core, but it happens due to the generator effect, which we looked at before, which is when you have a change in magnetic field um, around a conductor, you induce a potential difference. So if there's an amateur at the other, other end, um, we can talk about there's an alternating current being induced as well. Now, as in the diagram, the number of coils in the primary versus the secondary coil can be different or will be different, depending on whether it's a uh, step up or a step down transformer. So in this case, it's a step down transformer indicated by the fact that I've got less coils on the secondary coil than the primary coil. The equation that governs the number of turns on the coil um, versus the potential difference is here. So it says that the ratio of the number of turns on the primary over the number of turns on the secondary coil is equal to the ratio of potential difference um, supplied to the primary coil and the secondary coil. So if you were, I give my example here, my ratio is it goes a step down transformer because there's less turns, it goes down by a factor of 3 over 2, so therefore the potential difference would have to go down by a factor of 3 over 2 as well. Last equation to do with transformers is one that assumes that they are 100% efficient, which they're not, but allows us to use this equation um, as an assumption. So if something's 100% efficient, it means that um, the amount of energy that goes into it is equal to the amount of energy that comes out, or the power in is equal to the power out, that's the energy per second. Now, power we might know from paper one, the electricity topic is given by current times by potential difference. So that means across the primary coil, the current times the potential difference is equal to the power across the secondary coil, meaning the current times potential difference um, across the secondary coil indicated by the letter S and letter P for primary coil. So when we increase the potential difference for a step up transformer, what we're doing is doing that to reduce the current. So if I increase the PD, the current has to go down to keep the power constant, and that reduces heat loss to the circuit. If you want to check out my video on electricity, there's a lot more detail there, but it makes it a lot more efficient in reality. Now, if you want some examples of using these kinds of equations, um, then definitely check out um, the video I've linked uh, here at the top um, for examples of lots of different calculations and how to set them out. And there we go, there's the topic of electromagnetism. Well done for sticking through to the end. Um, if you hope you found it really useful, please like it um, or leave me a comment if there's something you don't understand.